we can fix social anxiety once we understand the cycle of social anxiety. So here's where we start. So it starts here at the top. The idea of socializing with people, the idea of interacting with other human beings makes you worried. Maybe you're concerned that you're gonna make some type of a social mistake. Maybe you're concerned that people are gonna think you're weird. Whatever the reason is, the idea of interacting with other people makes you worried, right? So then because you're worried about interacting with other people, you choose to just not do that. You choose to withdraw from social opportunities. So you don't go and talk to people who are nearby you. You don't talk to the cashiers, right? More and more and more, you withdraw from every social opportunity. Then because you're withdrawing from every social opportunity, your ability to practice your social skills goes down. Your confidence in yourself to act efficiently and not weird in social situations goes down. And your confidence in your self-image goes down because you start to judge yourself like, oh, I'm not interacting with other people. Are people going to judge me for not being social, right? So even more your self-esteem and your confidence goes down. So then because your social skills haven't been getting practice, they've been getting worse, your self-confidence, your self-image, it's all going down. Well, then the idea of socializing makes you even more worried. Like, oh my God, now I definitely can't do it. So what do you do? you withdraw even more. So then what happens? Your social skills get even worse. Then what happens? You withdraw even more, right? The social anxiety loop. Then there's also the fake it till you make it option where you pretend to be somebody who you think you're not, but you think other people will actually like. The fake it till you make it option sounds kind of good, but has a whole list of problems of its own that deserve its own video. This video is about the social anxiety spiral, the social anxiety loop, how to get out of it. But if you're interested in the video on social fraud, being a social fraud and how to get out of that and what to do, subscribe because that's coming in the future. So let's talk about how do we actually break this cycle? Where do we intervene? What do we actually have to change? So we can start by understanding that we have our actions, the things that we do, right? Do I go over and kick the ball or do I not? Do I go over and talk to this person or do I not? We have our actions, the things we do in our day to day life. And through a combination of our thoughts and our feelings, these things influence our actions and kind of decide on whether or not we're actually going to do something or not do something. Say, for example, we have a feeling of really big anxiety plus thoughts going through our head that are telling us people are going to hate you if you do this. Obviously, that's going to lead to an action of not being social, right? So a combination of anxious thoughts and anxious feelings is going to lead to social withdrawal and then perpetuate the loop of social anxiety. But Thoughts don't just come out of nowhere, right? They don't just spawn up for no reason whatsoever. So what causes these thoughts? Ah, that's where we get to the level that goes a little bit above this. And we have our beliefs. Beliefs are a little bit different to thoughts. They don't always exist consciously. We're not always aware of them, but they're very much there. And whatever's happening in the present day, in the here and now, gets filtered through the lens of our beliefs before leading to our thoughts and our feelings. So say, for example, we have a belief that other people are evil, right? Just as an example, for example, we believe fundamentally in our heart of hearts that other people are evil. Then whenever we have a situation where people are involved, we're going to have feelings of anxiety, right? Because if we think people are evil, of course, that's going to make us anxious. And we're going to have thoughts around like, this is going to go really bad because people are evil. And then it's going to lead to actions of you know, not engaging with other people because we believe that people are evil. So we get anxious thoughts and anxious feelings about people. Or take, for example, if you have a belief, a very common one is, I'm not good enough, right? If you have the belief in your unconscious mind of, I'm not good enough, then whenever there's an opportunity to talk to other people, to maybe make new friends, well, then your thoughts in that situation are probably going to be, well, if I'm not good enough, they're not going to like me. So what's the point of doing it, right? So therefore, a belief of I'm not good enough leads to thoughts of not wanting to do it, probably leads to feelings of feeling bad, feeling anxious, and it leads to actions of not engaging. So beliefs are the layer that's above our thoughts and feelings, right? But what causes beliefs? Because you're not born into this world with a belief of I'm not good enough. A newborn baby doesn't come out thinking that it's not good enough to be loved, that it's not good enough to make friends or that people are evil, right? We're not born with our beliefs. So what happens is that early on in a person's life, we're learning, right? We're learning about all kinds of things. How do I walk? How do I talk? How does a stove work? How does a light switch work, right? We're learning all kinds of things. And what will happen is you'll have an event, some type of event, maybe as a baby or a toddler, you're crawling around, you want your parents to play with you, but then they seem to ignore you. Ooh, how does the infant mind rationalize this? Well, an infant mind, a toddler's mind, a young child's mind, it can't perspective take. It can't think from another person's perspective at a young age. It doesn't think, oh, maybe they're busy. Maybe they just didn't hear me. Maybe they just didn't see what was going on. No, no, 
they take it very personally, right? So in the toddler's mind, when it gets ignored by its parents or ignored by its friends, the mind rationalizes and goes, well, why is that? Well, maybe it's because I'm not lovable. That's why mom and dad aren't playing with me. Maybe it's because I'm not good enough. That's why my friends aren't playing with me, right? It's these events that create a belief in the first place. But if this only happens one time, if there's only like one event, a really small event, this belief isn't going to be very powerful. And there's going to be all those other times in a kid's life where the parents do play with them and the friends do pay attention to them. And those prop up the belief of I am good enough and I am lovable. And that would become the dominant belief in a person's life. But if they have one event that signals to them not being good enough, NGE, not good enough, right? But then something happens. There's another time where they get ignored and another time where their friends ignore them and another time where a series of events where they just consistently feel like they're not good enough and that's the explanation for why things are happening. Then what happens is this belief of not being good enough, what happens to it? Well, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Over time, it just continues to grow and grow and grow because it has more and more and more events that are reinforcing it, that are making it more powerful and more believable over time. And once a belief gets big enough and it becomes the dominant belief in a person's mind, then that's when the mind starts to filter everything that happens through that belief. You go to work with the belief of I'm not good enough, well, you're less likely to apply for a promotion, right? Because you're not good enough. You go to a new school, a new university, you're thinking about introducing yourself to make friends, but if you have the belief of I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, filtering all of these thoughts and all this information through that, well, you're less likely to actually try and do that, right? Different scenarios, same belief, limiting your outcomes. The brain is using the beliefs that it holds to help it predict how it thinks things are going to go in the future. And then based on those predictions, it guides your actions. So when you have negative limiting beliefs that have a lot of reinforcing events, it's going to take a lot to cut it down. But if you'll recall me saying, people will have other events in their life. They won't just have negative events in their life, right? People are going to have events in their life of times where they felt good enough. I'm just going to put G, right? Times where people felt good enough. Let's move this one up here. And they're going to have all the times in their life where their friends played with them and their parents told them they loved them and all these times where they felt good enough and they felt lovable. And each time one of these things happen, well, then the belief of being good enough gets bigger and bigger and bigger as well. But here's where it gets really, really tricky. If the beliefs of being good enough, if the good enough belief is pretty small, but the not good enough belief is pretty big, then what happens is when new information is coming into the brain, a new event happens and the brain's trying to decide where does this go? Does this support the not good enough story? Does it support the good enough story? If the not good enough belief is the dominant one, it'll begin to filter this information. So it'll look for pieces of information from this new event that confirm what it thinks it already knows. So say, for example, it goes into a social situation and maybe in that situation, people were smiling and talking to you, but one person walked away from you when you said something. The brain goes, oh, I know what's happening. I'm not good enough. So it will filter out the information that could come in and reinforce the good enough story. It'll stop that from coming through, but it'll take that bit of information about a person walking away and be like, oh, look at that new reinforcing event proving that I'm not good enough because the brain likes to be right. And the brain, once it has dominant beliefs set up, it doesn't want to go back and undo those. It doesn't want to be proven wrong. It doesn't want to have to deal with this contention in its mind of, is this thing true or is this other thing true? It creates a dominant belief and it kind of wants to stick to that. So then what do you actually need to do in this situation? Because it's kind of complicated, right? Three things, three things you need to do in this situation. First thing, number A, number one, Look at all of these reinforcing events that are propping up and keeping this not good enough or limiting belief alive. Go back, reevaluate them, cut them down and stop them from propping up and reinforcing these limiting beliefs. Number two, think about the belief that you would actually prefer to live your life with having in its dominant position. So for example, the belief of being good enough and start to add more events to here. Start to look for evidence that conforms and confirms this belief, right? and prop it up, make it stronger, make it bigger. And C, stop avoiding social situations that make you anxious, because the more you avoid them, the more we get into this loop of anxiety where you withdraw and your social skills and confidence goes down, then you avoid some more, right? The more you avoid, the more this cycle keeps on going. You have to break the cycle. And the amazing thing is, is once you break the cycle, then social events start happening and you start looking for positive pieces of information, things that have gone right, then all of a sudden you start to be able to add more new evidence to the belief of being good enough. Now, if you 
engage in these social situations, but you're just on the lookout for things going wrong, then what happens is you actually add more events to the not good enough belief. But if you purposefully reflect and review on social situations and you look for ways that things went right, things you learned, things that were good, you get to prop up this new positive belief. Now, there's a whole nother segment. So this is addressing beliefs, but there's a whole nother segment of things that you can do to address your feelings and things you can do to address your thoughts because, hey, they're also two pieces of the puzzle. While your beliefs definitely influence and heavily impact on what feelings you have and what thoughts you have. So I think addressing beliefs is probably the biggest thing to do because it underlays everything else. I think taking proper time to address your feelings is really important. And I think that addressing and challenging some of your maladaptive and unhelpful thought patterns is really, really helpful too. But I think if you want to make the biggest change, it has to come from challenging and changing your beliefs. Now, when it comes to addressing thoughts and feelings, feelings are pretty simple to address, right? There's a ton of strategies out there on how to regulate your emotions, how to calm yourself down, how to manage the actual physical feelings of anxiety and worry. When it comes to thoughts, things get a little bit more complicated. And for the purpose of this video, I really wanted to focus on what I think is the highest priority thing. I think that beliefs are the highest priority thing. And I think that beliefs are the least well understood by the general population. So I think it's worth spending my time here first. Addressing thoughts though, I think is still very important. It's something that I think people should generally learn how to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so a full video on what to do with your thoughts, how to address them and how to change them in the purpose of addressing social anxiety and depression and other forms of anxiety. I'm gonna make a full rundown video on that in the future. But nonetheless, if you can start to chop down the pillars that are propping up your limiting beliefs and if you start to add new pillars of support to your positive and helpful beliefs that's going to go a long way so to recap if you want to make big change to your social anxiety you need to do a couple of things you need to stop avoiding social situations and get out there and practice you need to look at how did this happen in the first place? What are my self-limiting beliefs and what are the events that have happened throughout my life that have propped up these limiting beliefs? And you need to start looking for a more helpful, a more adaptive, a more useful belief that you can have about yourself and the world and start adding and finding evidence to prop this up and support this new belief. Because once you've really made these changes to your beliefs, the downstream effects of that can be extremely profound. I hope this was helpful. I hope it wasn't too esoteric. I hope it was at least a little bit clear. If you have questions, if parts were confusing, let me know as a comment and I'll do my best to address them. Thank you. Bye.